the rains come again, until there is nothing left of road or wood or field. Nothing in the entire world but mud. The exhausted English soldiers hoist their longbows over their heads, trying to protect the precious yew wood from the water. The empty wagons can scarcely roll forward, even though all of the supplies have long been eaten. From the rear, terrifying hoofbeats resound. The French knights have come. The English have been in a slow retreat ever since the debacle at Harfleur, where King Henry V's glorious siege dragged on and on, costing the lives of 3,000 Englishmen. Now, Henry has all but abandoned his dream of establishing his hereditary claim to the French crown. Like his men, he only wants to reach Calais and the ships that will return them home to England. But on the road back to Calais, the French army overtakes Henry. Knowing that the English are fatigued, starving and outnumbered three to one, the French have no interest in negotiation. The English make their stand on a wooded hilltop. The archers plant stakes in the ground to offer some barrier against the deadly French cavalry. Henry's only hope is that his lightly armored infantry prove more nimble than the impetuous French knights and that the range of his archers can even the odds before the French horses are upon them. The Battle of Agincourt is remembered not because it was an inevitable triumph, but because it was an upset. Outnumbered English longbows were victorious over French knights only because the knights had to charge up a muddy hill through a dense forest. The English wore little armor and were able to catch the encumbered French in the middle of their retreat. A charge by Henry and his surviving cavalry pushed aside the beaten French and opened the road to the coast. Despite his victory, Henry did not follow through on his attack but withdrew to England. The true winner of the battle was Burgundy, which was able to come to power in a vacuum emptied by both the English and the French.